Coming up on this episode of Unscripted Faith, from a life influenced by mobsters defining his call in ministry, my good friend and fellow Hard Question panelist, Pastor Pete Giacalone, is here with us to share his remarkable, remarkable journey and what God has in store for him next. Oh, I can't wait to hear his story and find out how one woman is making it her mission to fight for every life. Amy, Amy Shuring of the Women's Choice Network discusses the critical importance of choosing life in every situation. And we're glad you chose to tune in because this episode of Unscripted Faith will uplift, encourage, and inspire you. So let's get started. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You know, we are back in the house. It's good to be with you, and I'm excited about today. We've got some homegrown people in the house today. Oh, I can't wait to hear Pastor Pete's testimony. Yes, indeed, it's going to be good, and you may be familiar with him. You can see him along with myself here on Cornerstone TV's Hard Question. He's also lead pastor at South Hills Assembly of God. My good friend, Pastor Pete, good to be with good you morning, here on Unscripted Faith. It's a beautiful morning here in Pennsylvania. It's a yes, beautiful it day in the neighborhood, one man <laughs> said at one point. Would you be my neighbor? <laughs> you, know what, you know, even though you sit across from me know, uh, buddy, on hard questions yeah, and even here you're across, yeah. uh, you definitely are a neighbor, a uh, yeah. good friend of the I ministry think. here and also of myself. I tell you what, we love it. Yeah, it's I awesome. Love it. I love having a friend like you, buddy. It's awesome. Really well, you know, I know you personally, yeah. but a lot of people don't know about your story sure. and about how you came to the Lord. Obviously, you've pastored mm -hmm. a couple of churches, several churches. Yeah. I mean, you've done so much for the Lord, but tell us how you got there and how you found the Lord. Jay, I grew up in a, if you can imagine, an all Sicilian home. Now, can Sicilian isn't a perfect blood. Everybody conquered Sicily. And <laughs> if you talk to a true Italian, they wouldn't consider Sicily Italian. You understand, as far mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. northern Italy. Um, our whole background all goes to Sicily. Um, growing up, I would ask questions because my one grandmother and grandfather lived with us in our home. Uh, we had that typical Sicilian, where they spoke. When they didn't want us to know what was going on, they spoke, <laughs> you know, Sicilian uh, or Italian. And, um, <clears throat> but I'd always ask about another grandfather, and I'd always get, well, he was a nice guy. <laughs> and then, when I was, Jay, I think I was about 12 or 13. My dad wanted to keep us out of the pool halls. So we had a, a pool table in our basement and, and got pretty good at shooting pool. And uh, we had my uncle Vinny, Vince, came to visit from St. Louis. Now, my mother's whole side was St. Louis, and her maiden name was Gianola. So we're sitting at the dining room table eating, and I said, Uncle Vince, do you know anything about my grandfather? And every, every head went down. See, he was the general. He, he ran and controlled all of St. Louis, Missouri, and my wow. Uncle Vince was part of that regime that I knew nothing of. Wow. I am 70 years old, and I'm still finding out stories wow. that, seriously, because uh, the tight lip, never talking about things, it was never discussed. Matter of fact, if we even mentioned the word mafia at the table, we got smacked. Wow. It, oh, no, 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 no. That was a taboo subject. You didn't bring it up at, at home. You didn't talk about it at all. Wow. So I get my Uncle Vince downstairs. I'm going to shoot around the pool with him, you know, and hustle him. I, I got the break, and then he ran the table. What I, <laughs> <laughs> what I mean by ran the table, he, he sunk every ball. He leaned over to me and said, boy, never shoot pool with a stranger. You know, and then, then he gave me the most important advice in life, never bet unless it's fixed. <laughs> <laughs> so those were some of the, but um, yeah, this, matter of fact, the ring I have on, that's 100 years old. It was my grandfather's. Wow. Um, and uh, how I came to get that was amazing because, you see, when I gave my life to Christ, we have a, a very large family in Detroit. I mean, very large, extended. Matter of fact, my other grandfather, and he went 6'2", he was a massive individual. Uh, when he was alive, every Sunday, a hundred of us got together on his property. Every, wow. the family, wow. we weren't wow. allowed to bring wow. friends. The women would cook, the men would play cards. Yep. Uh, as long as money was involved, the men did it. <laughs> So, um, so that was, and you know, gambling, oh my, my goodness, we were gambling at age five as far as playing for money and, and then 
you know, that kind of grew on. So in the midst of this, I had no peace. I had no joy, mm. no peace. Uh, hot tempered, always in trouble. Mm. Oh. Hot tempered. Oh, Jay. I'm surprised. Jay. I'm surprised. Jay, I, I'm not kidding. Yeah. I'm very, very hot tempered. Yeah, and that's, that's surprising because, I mean, you're a very mild, very people person. Mm -hmm. I would say if, you know, if you weren't a pastor, you definitely could be a politician. Oh, Jay. <laughs> so, but, without oh, a doubt. But Jay, I was fighting every day. Maybe because of my shortness, and in those days, I was very, very big. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, I was made fun of and all that. Wow. So, so, I'm fighting every day. But then, when I came to eighth grade, uh, started dabbling with drinking. And then before you know it, uh, running with the wrong crowd, wrong people, getting in trouble, no peace. That's, and then a couple of my friends, one, one acquaintance uh, got into the drugs. You know, I go back to the 60s, 70s, the days of LSD and all that. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I was at, at one too many funerals. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking out of a funeral. At that time, I was probably 16. And I turned to my closest friends. I said, that's it. I want nothing to do. Uh, they said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. Wow. But I started, started my search. I was at an all-boy, private, Catholic, elite. When mm. I say elite, we graduated white tuxedo, black bow tie. Wow. That, that was a very elite school there. Austin Catholic Prep run by the Augustinian Meyer, uh, friars and monks and all of that. So when I gave my heart to, at that time, again, I had no peace. This is during the Jesus movement. And the Jesus movement was quite big in the Detroit oh, yeah. area. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Rap sessions everywhere. Yeah. So I met an individual, led me to Christ. But at that time, when I got saved now, uh, my family wanted nothing to do with me. Wow. Uh, matter of fact, Ron Hambury wanted to write my grandmother's, because Ron and I were very close, wanted to write my grandmother's life story. And I remember I was home <clears throat> one time, and I... I said, Graham, I got a buddy of mine. He wants to write your life story. My dad said, my dad came around the corner and said, there's nothing to tell. Wow. wow. I said, no, no, no. There's, matter of fact, portions of the movie The Godfather yes. were taken from our family background. So, you know, they took a lot wow. of scenes here, there, yeah, there, yeah. and put a story like they did with the Titanic. Titanic was a, a real thing, but then they built a story around. They, yeah. That's the same thing. And we had family members wanting my grandmother to sue the makers, oh yeah, because it was wow. way too close. And my grandmother said, if I sue, I show my hand. She said, leave it alone. See, when they, wow. when my grandfather died natural causes, of course his brother was gunned down like one of the scenes in, in, in The Godfather. So the day my grandfather died, my gr mom used to eat at a very influential people's homes like Gussie Bush back in the days, mm -hmm. Bush wow. Bavarian. And that, uh, again, I'm going back. Wow to the 30s yeah. um, <clears throat> because they own taverns and all of that and they bought beer off them. So, okay. Uh, so what happened was when my grandfather died, they literally went from wealth. He bought a brand new car every six months during the depression. So hello, you know, uh, yeah. yeah, that's, that's pretty well to do. Without a doubt. But what happened was when, when he died, somebody got in the room because in those days they didn't keep their money their fortunes in the bank. Mm -hmm. Somebody got in the room before her, my grandmother, and they literally went from wealth to poverty, literally overnight. Wow. Mm -hmm. My grandmother, of course, he was indicted for some murders, and they spent a, a whole fortune to clear the family name. So there's a lot there. But even to this day, there's a lot. I do, I, my grandmother never named a name to the day she died, no names. You want to hear a story? I'll tell you a story. No names. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one mm -hmm. quick story real quick. One time they, uh, they were out for this hit man, and my grandmother <clears throat> and her sister-in-law, the hit man, the feds were after this guy, was actually in my grandmother's house. So what they did is they took this guy. Those, these were the days of the big feather mattresses. They yep, took this yep. guy. They put him in the middle of the, of the two mattresses, and, the fe and, my, and her sister-in-law acted oh like God. she was sick. So, so the feds are coming in, interrogating my grandmother and her sister-in-law, and right, the guy they're looking for is right in oh between the map. God. True story, right? Wow. In between. They got wow. away with it. So, wow. But, wow. The, but the thing was, a lot of, lot of the family, for years, uh, uh, St. Louis side, Detroit side, but you know, I endured, mm. 
And before many of them died, because all of them are dead now, before many of them died, I had the joy of leading them to the Lord, even my own dad. Mm. So, that yeah, was it was, it was, it's been a fun life and it's not over. Well, <laughs> we've got right. about a minute left. Okay. Uh, how did you come to the Lord though? Well, Jay, it was a young lady, uh, a beautiful young lady that uh, she was born, she was raised in the church. Mm -hmm. She was Sicilian. She was, I, I take it back. She, she wasn't Sicilian. She was Italian, uh, refined Italian. But her mom insisted, uh, I'll never forget it. She, mom, her mom read me like a book. She <laughs> said, look, if you, I, I didn't raise my, my daughter to, to be a Christian for you to come along. <laughs> you know, she knew who I was. She read right through me. She said, uh, if you're going to date my daughter, you're going to church. You're going to be in church. I was in church for Sunday school. I was in church for Sunday morning. I was in church Sunday night. Wednesday, it was too far of a drive. I couldn't make it, you know, because they lived in Beverly Hills, Michigan. I lived on the east side. So it was a long drive. But going to church for six months, soul searching, no peace. One day, a uh, rap session, and someone came. The, the pastor came, zeroed in on me, and wow. just said, hey, you know what? And he took me through the four spiritual laws, and Jay, my heart broke. Mm. I, I decided wow. I wasn't looking for religion or denomination. I was looking for uh, peace. Yeah. And that night, I, I kid you not, the very night I accepted Christ into my heart, my life changed radically. Wow. Wow. I immediately, immediately set free of, of I, was, I was a cheap wino. I never did drugs, you know, yeah. Boone's Farm, Apple uh, Wine, Thunderbird, that was it. But when I gave my life to Christ, instantaneously, mm. instant, and that's what threw my family off. Wow. My dad one day said to me, <clears throat> Pete, when you were drinking, we could understand you. Wow. But now that you've given your life to Christ and just want to carry that Bible, I had one of those big thick black yeah. ones. He said, uh, you're lost. <laughs> well, you know, it's amazing because, you know, God saved you to, right. to see all of your family saved. Yes. And yes. now yes. all the things that you're doing. I wish we had more time to go into everything that's going on at South Hills. Yeah. I know you're yeah. transitioning, doing some great things. But I know, not to speak on behalf of myself and yeah. uh, Cornerstone and all of us here, uh, you've done so many great things for the station here. And even in Pittsburgh, you've left a great legacy. So thank you so much for sharing your story thank and you. all that you're doing. Yes. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. Don't go anywhere because Amy Shuring from the Women's Choice Network joins us next here on Unscripted Faith. We'll be right back. God is doing a new thing. Be ready for it. With your best gift today, request Prophetic Reset, a powerful resource by prophetic leader and pastor Joshua Giles. You'll discover a 40-day journey unlike any other, one that will reposition you under God's powerful anointing, deepen your relationship with Him, and propel you forward. Through empowering scriptures, biblical insights, and prophetic tips, you'll discover how to reactivate your spiritual gifts and faith, release the old to seek Him anew, rest your mind in His counsel, and hear His wisdom for your next season. Even more, you'll witness His word manifest in your life and return to His promises for you. Ask for a prophetic reset when you give in support of Cornerstone Television today. Every gift helps us to spread the gospel through Christian programming. Call 888-665-4483 or give online at ctvn.org slash donate. Our next guest knows very well how critical it is to fight for each and every life. And she's made it her goal to save as many lives as possible. Amy Shuring is the executive director of the Women's Choice Network, and she joins us now. Amy, hey. thank you for coming to Unscripted Faith. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for having me. So good to see you good guys. See you. Yes. So good to see you. Listen, let's get right in on it because uh, I know you have a lot to share. First, let me say thank you for just your fight for life. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but you helped mm -hmm. my wife and I get started and we're forever grateful. Yeah. You've done so much. You've supported us financially. You've supported us with wisdom and knowledge. I mean, you've been in the game since the 80s. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the game is changing. Right. Uh, now we're, we've seen Roe v. Wade overturned. Um, we see that the abortion pill is now out. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to us a little bit about mm -hmm. kind of just your thoughts on that and how you've mm -hmm. shifted in your fight for life? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think the uh, election cycle, mm -hmm. at least for the last two years, has really done a lot of damage in terms of there's just been a lot of misinformation, a lot mm -hmm. of things that are thrown out there as truth that, you know, we have to really sift through. And one of those is, is the abortion pill. And, uh, you know, we hear that name tossed around a lot. And, and that's something that, ha that um, you know, has grown because of 2020. 
Um, yeah. it, was, it was really um, unleashed on the population up until 14 weeks, which is um, a crazy number. And so the abortion pill, you know, for the listeners, really is a series of pills. It causes uh, the woman's body to um, not produce progesterone. So she's not producing pro progesterone, the baby cannot live. And so four or five days later, the baby is di has died because of the lack of progesterone. And then the second set of pills cause her to expel that, that baby. And what this has done is demedicalized abortion. It has taken it out of the hands of doctors. And this is a woman by herself who uh, takes these pills and has an abortion in her home, in, you know, in the bathroom, and has to flush the remains down the toilet. It is really a gruesome, horrible thing, and I don't even want to get into all the details on it, but what it has done is it has left like a generation of women um, really confused about what abortion is and where it came from, and, and I think it's looked at as a remedy. Abortion is considered a remedy for all kinds of things. As we're hearing, like rape and incest, or you know, poverty, or whatever, like this is a remedy. And what I've learned over the years is abortion is never the remedy. Right. It never has That's been. Right. And I think that the defining story for me was really the first client I ever saw. And so, you know, going back in time, and I was a young Christian, um, you know, thrust into a job that I had no credential for, really, as the executive director of this pregnancy movement. And we opened on Mother's Day in 1985. So we, <laughs> we had this grand opening on a Sunday. Wow. And, uh, and this is back, you know, when uh, abortion was taking the lives of one half of all pregnancies in Allegheny County. Mm. Get your head around that. One half of all pregnancies in Allegheny County ended in abortion in 1985. And uh, so we were really in, in the midst of a big fight. But we were young and we thought we could change the world and we and uh, God is good, right? Oh, so Lord. we opened up this center and Monday morning, the first person that comes through the door, you know, I was loaded for bear. I had training, I, was, I had a master's in counseling and I thought, I am going to talk this woman out of an abortion. <laughs> <laughs> so she sat down in front of me across, across a desk and told me her story. And she mm -hmm. said, uh, I'm married, I have a, a three-year-old at home who has some profound learning disabilities. He's had a genetic disorder um, he has physical and mental uh, challenges. And she said, and just a few weeks ago, I found out that I have cancer. And my husband left me when he found out that I have cancer. So I'm alone with this three-year-old. Oh, and she nice. said, and part of the testing for the cancer revealed that I'm pregnant. Mm. And she said, the doctor told me to go to the nearest abortion clinic and get an abortion so that I would be here for my little boy. And I gotta tell you, I'm looking across the desk and I had nothing. No. I had no. nothing. And I, I, I asked a really lame question I, that I learned in my counseling degree at Pitt. And I said, how does that make you feel? Yeah, right. Yeah, right, <laughs> so, so lame. Yeah. And, but she was gracious and she said, um, well, I, I'm a, I was raised Catholic. I think abortion is wrong. And I'm really sorry that I have to do it. And so I said, well, you were raised Catholic, so do you go to Mass, do you pray? And she said, well, you know, I go to, I go to Mass. And I said, well, I, I said, I believe in prayer. I believe mm -hmm. God answers prayer. Mm -hmm. So how about if we take a week and we just pray about it? Mm -hmm. And she, she liked that idea. You know, she, was, she said, okay, we'll take a week, we'll pray about it. And during that week, I, I, I called everyone I knew. <laughs> I, I called churches, I called the 700 Club, I called convents where I knew nuns were praying 24 seven. <laughs> and I literally got thousands of people praying for her in a week. And during that week, our volunteers were going to her house, they were mowing her grass. I remember some men put up her screens, wow, awesome. you know, because her husband was gone and people bought groceries, they were watching her, her little boy. So she came back a week later and she said, can we take another week? And I said, okay. Let's take another week. Well, one week turned into two and two into three. And the third week she came back and she said, you know, I have an, I have an appointment with my oncologist tomorrow and, um, and I'm kind of afraid to face him because he's gonna, he's gonna wonder why I haven't had this abortion. And I said, well, do you want me to go with you? I'll, I'll, I'll come with you. And she said, no, I, I'll be good. And a couple days later, her doctor called me and he said, uh, I don't know what you guys are doing over there, but Beth no longer has cancer. Wow. Come Praise on. God. Wow. Yeah. Praise I know. God. Jesus. And he said this, he said, the nearest we can tell this pregnancy 
put her body into remission. And he said, I think if she'd had an abortion, she'd be dead by now. Thank you. Now, Jesus. yeah, I, I got to tell you guys, at that moment, I knew that there would never be a situation that God couldn't handle. I knew that there would never be some, something that, that abortion would remedy. Do you know what I mean? I knew that there would never be a story that would sit across the desk for me that God couldn't reach through and change. And it was powerful. And, and so ever since then, that's really been my confidence is my God. He is so gracious, so good. And, and though, though, you know, the clients that we see, they make horrible decisions. You know, they, they do dumb things like all of us. But God is so gracious. And he healed that woman. And she had a beautiful baby girl uh, who really helped her in the long term care for this little boy. But, you know, that's why I have this tremendous peace about yes. what I do. And, so, you know, it's 40 years later almost. It'll be 40 years next year. And, you know, I got, but God has been so faithful through that. And don't we all have kind of that defining moment where yes. we decide, you know, God is good and I can follow him and I can trust him. And, and for me, that was that moment. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it's awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is so powerful to think the God of life yes. would restore her life when she herself chose life. Yes, yeah. I mean, have yeah. there been other moments, <laughs> I'm sure, in your 40 yeah. years that you have, someone has sat across from you and they're like, this is impossible yeah. and you've been able to relay that story right. or something like it? Yeah, I, I, I try not to, you know, to tell other people's story. I really want to concentrate on, on the client's mm -hmm. story at the time. And you know what? Every client feels like their story is impossible. Yes. You know, it may, not be, it may not be that story, but for them, it is, a, it is a huge impossible situation. And I think what, you know, what we need as Christians is to know that God is the God of the impossible. Yes. And so we can share that. You know, we can tell her that. And um, I think from the moment that I came to Christ, you know, I was young and um, I just knew that, uh, you know, I was given that confidence and, and I'll actually tell that quick story if yes, that's okay. Yes. So going way back and I was in high school and um, it was during that same like Jesus revolution that, you know, we yeah. just heard Pastor Pete talking about um, that, uh, you know, there was a lot going on. And, um, but I sat down in front of a, a youth pastor and he, ha he had a pen, and I'll just use this little stir. He had a pen in his hand, and he said, you know, God has a gift for you, and it's the gift of his son and his sacrifice. When is this yours? Mm -hmm. And so I took the other end of the pen, and, and you know, like this, and, and just before I took it, I said, well, wh when I take it, it's mine. And he, just before I took it, he it gave a little tug on the mm -hmm. other side, and he said this. He said, come and die, and then let go. Wow. Wow. And you know, isn't that what, isn't that what this is? You know, I am crucified with Christ. I, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And, and I think that we, you know, when, when we come to Christ, we have to remember yes. that. That we come and, and we die to, to ourselves. We die to what the world tells us about yes. things. And, uh, and we, put it, we put on a new, you know, we are a new creation. And, you know, those are the things that really allow every ordinary Christian to be someone extraordinary in this life. Don't you think? I mean, Amen. yeah. Yes. <laughs> so that's kind of what we expect inside of our centers is that our staff and our board and our volunteers, you know, they take on an extraordinary life. They, yes. they die to self. They die to the ordinary. And we become his vessels for really impossible, extraordinary things. Yeah, he's so good. Amen. Amen. So yeah. good, yeah. Amy. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing your story oh, yeah. and for yeah. doing what you are doing to save so many lives. For 40 yeah. years. We yeah. really appreciate Almost what you've done. You are definitely the trailblazer for pro-life oh, in Pittsburgh thanks. and yeah. your yeah. legacy is outstanding. Yeah, it's, it's the Lord. Yeah, he's, he's so good. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Beautiful. Amen. Well, there's still plenty more to come on Unscripted Faith as Jay and I share our final takeaways when we return. So stay with us. We left the light on for you. Cornerstone Network is your home for Christian television. A place of rest, a beacon of truth, your source of encouragement and entertainment. Welcome home.
Well, welcome back. And this is my favorite part because we get a chance to take some give you some of our takeaways from what's happened. You know, you listen to Pastor Pete and Amy. You know what I think of is two major trailblazers yes. in this city that are standing yes. for life, not just yes. the life in the womb, but from the womb to the tomb yes. and the battle that both of them have been. We didn't hear a lot of Amy's battles, but we heard Pastor Pete's battles and you know, even dealing with the family and being raised yes. in, in the mob, you know, I was like, <laughs> you like got the Godfather story that's been redeemed. And uh, it's just really cool to see uh, where God has brought them and just the journey that they've been on. Because both of them, you know, you look back 40 some odd years yes. being in the ministry and the impact they made, I think is outstanding. It is. It's, they've chosen every day, moment by moment, to, as Amy said, die to themselves. You yeah. know, and like yeah. it's beautiful because when I think about Pastor Pete's story, he was really raised in a family that was participating in kind of like a culture of death, right? right I right, mean, like right. power, but it was all fueled by death and how now he is spewing out life everywhere he goes, just yeah, like yeah. Amy, these, these amazing ministers who are truly changing this region and this globe really with their trickle effect of being found in Christ. Yeah, without a doubt. And uh, just I go back again about just the trailblazers. You know, yeah. we've been blessed in Pittsburgh yes. to see men and women of God like that. You know, I'm, yes. I'm newer to Pittsburgh. I've only been here about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so these are people like even with my wife and I, I what uh, Amy has been to us is outstanding. She was one of the first people that we met with. Her uh, center has helped us financially in ways that I can't even begin to tell. I mean, she has given us so much wisdom. She sat down with us. She was never competitive with us and she helped us so then we could do what it is that we're called to do. And I was just looking at the both of them. I was like, wow, we have so many people yes. in Pittsburgh that have made such an impact and made yes. a difference. And I'm looking at the both of them. I'm like, wow, you know, Pete, I mean, he's uh, had been the reason why many churches have yes. succeeded. Three, yes. four, five churches. I yes. mean, he's helped with the pro-life movement. He was a part of, part of the first um, pro-life pregnancy center that actually got started here in Pittsburgh. Wow. So it's really cool just to see their stories and what God has done. And Pastor Pete, actually, you may not know this, but his daughter, Kate, is the principal at my kids' Christian school at wow. Central Christian wow. Assembly. And the impact her life is making. Yeah. I mean, it is just a ripple effect of legacy, you know, when we die to ourselves, right? Amen. Amen. So today we say, pick up your cross with Christ. Die to yourself that not you would live, but Christ through you and watch what he does through your life. You'll be amazed in each moment. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.